let's talk about some of the theoretical considerations we need to talk about when we're talking about bulk electrolysis. The goal is always going to be completion of the reaction. Unlike analytical electrochemistry or other uh, uh, methods where we're just doing a portion of the material, we want to try to remove all of it. So we have to consider ourselves, have to consider a couple of things. One is this mass transport process. The other is the actual thermodynamics of the process. Can we actually remove all the material based on the equilibrium considerations of the, of the system? So one thing what let's think about is completeness of a reaction. How can we guarantee when we do the reaction that we will be complete and fully electrolyzed all the solution? So we take our favorite redox couple, ox to red, and if we look at a, a limiting curve, I versus E, of course we have the limiting current there, and that would be the limiting current we deserve with, say, rotating disk electrode or, or so on. Now, the effective concentration of ox, as we recall, when we're on the plateau of that is zero. Uh, now, it's not exactly zero. It depends on the potential of the system and the kinetics of the system, but we can calculate it. It's going to be close enough to zero, usually. Now, often, in order to get that reaction to occur, we want to increase the rate of mass transport by stirring. And the other way to do it is, as I said, by using a very thin layer cell. We don't really need stirring because the, the diffusion path is very small and that makes the reaction very rapidly. But if we had a, a thin layer cells only work for analytical type systems where we're trying to figure out, uh, uh, figure out uh, say, number of electrons per mole or something like that. Uh, if we actually want to do a synthetic process, we're generally going to have a larger volume cell so that we actually make some amount of material. So the current then is going to be equal to NFA at the limiting point, NFA M0. And again, M0 is equal to D over delta uh, for a stirred solution where this delta is our thin layer or the boundary layer for our thin layer system or, or I'm sorry, by our stirred system, rotating disk electrode. Remember Faraday's law states that the amount of charge that we're going to be passing in this particular system is going to be equal to the number of electrons uh, per in this reaction. So N could be one or two or four or whatever. Uh, times the Faraday times the total moles of the system. So the charge is equal to that. So if we take the derivative of the number of moles, we see that that's equal to minus dQ um, and F. And that's going to be what that means is the moles produced out of the system. And the, the amount of dQ is equal to I dt. In other words, the, the, if we integrate the um, current, we'll get the a number of charge. Uh, if we take the derivative of the charge, it's going to be the current times the derivative of time. And the number of moles produced is going to be equal to V, D, C, zero to the bulk, where V is the volume. So the rate of change in the number of moles is going to be proportional to the volume of the solution times the rate of change of the concentration in the solution. Now remember, unlike the other systems where C zero star was a constant, not a constant in the bulk electrolysis process because we're continuously removing the material. So substituting those things in, the rate of change of the concentration of species O 
is equal to the current over NFV for volume times the time process. Or substituting in um, for the, some of the other things, we see that the rate of change is equal to the area, M sub zero, C sub zero star DT over V. Where we've taken our limiting current and put it in for that particular situation. So the rate of change is the electrode area over the volume times the mass transfer uh, coefficient. Remember, that's gonna be related to how efficiently we stir the system up. So that start, should start making sense. The, the bigger the area of the electrode, the faster the concentration can change. The bigger the volume we've got, the lower the electrode, the concentration can change. The faster we stir it, the greater the electrode concentration can change. Also, the greater the concentration, the gr faster the uh, concentration can change. And uh, times the derivative of time. Now, if we integrate that, we get the change of concentration with time equals the concentration at time equal to zero times an exponential function, which is equal to minus m sub zero a t over v. And uh, we can put that as a constant. You can see that would be equal to a constant times t or minus kt. So this is a classical exponential decay curve that depends on three constants, m sub zero a and v times the time parameter. So if we're doing the reaction and we're having good stirring that's constant with time, we should see an exponential decay of concentration starting from the initial concentration at time equals zero. And that would be exponential like so. And of course it doesn't go to zero but it asymptotically approaches um, zero at infinity. In fact, it approaches the concentration of the potential that we're actually at. So if we're on this plateau and we're sitting, say, here, concentration would be close to zero, but not exactly. Here would be more likely closer to zero. So we're talking about number of uh, decimal points, essentially close to zero. So if we do a reaction and we see this nice exponential curve, we have a pretty good indication that the reaction is uncomplicated. Uh, what we're doing is a simple process. There's no side reactions apparently causing a change in the process. And by looking at this curve, we can estimate where we would have to be to get the reaction to be complete. So if we look at, you can think of this as a time constant. So minus M zero A over V is a time constant. And uh, by um, making that so many time constants, we can make sure that we're down below to say 99% or whatever we prefer. So let's do an example. Suppose we have 0 0.250 cubic centimeters volume of tenth of a molar copper sulfate solution, electrolyzed at a 250 square centimeter cathode. So we're taking copper two and reducing it to copper zero at the cathode. And we're using an initial current of five amps. And we want to ask ourselves, how long will it take to get to 99% removal of the copper 2 plus? In other words, we only have 1% 1 1 of the original concentration left over. Well, the mass transfer coefficient is going to be equal to the current times the NFA over C0 star. And um, we know that's true because the initial current is set to that five amps. So since that supports that five amps of current, that's gonna give us our mass transfer coefficient. 
and we see that that's 1.04 times 10 to the minus 3 centimeters per second. All right, so our time constant, if you like, or electrolysis constant, M sub zero A over V is equal to 1.04 times 10 to the minus 3, or 1 times 10 to the minus 3 reciprocal seconds because we've magically picked units that cancel out. So <clears throat> we want to go from 0 0.1 molar to 1% 1 of that or 0 0.001 molar. We substitute in to get T and we find that the change is minus LN uh, 0.01. And that's um, 4,440 seconds or about 74 minutes. Now that's uh, that just like a uh, that's like a, uh, any sort of reaction. So if we start from this initial concentration and drop it down by another factor of 100, so 0 0.001 to 0 0.00005, or one, I should say, not one. <laughs> That's another same factor of 100 decrease, and so because it's a first order process, like a kinetics first order process, it's the same idea, we have a half reaction type kinetics, uh, that's again 74 minutes. So you can treat this as um, a simple first sort of kinetics using half times, half lives I should say, and uh, get the same result. All right, so that I think in retrospect is fairly straightforward. You don't have to worry about diluting hydrogen in the solution? Well, sure. Um, we assumed in this case that we we're, we're don't have any side reactions and the reaction is quantitative. In other words, all the electrons that we put in go to uh, form copper zero. Now in this case, we probably don't. Copper does not reduce to produce hydrogen typically. If we were trying to produce, say, iron metal by this method, we would not see a this sort of good behavior. We would produce a lot of hydrogen because, um, because the activity of iron is much higher than copper. Uh, but yeah, it's possible that you would see a, uh, uh, some side reactions, although in this particular case, we wouldn't have to worry about it too much. What would happen in that case is you would see, you would do, the, for example, you could do the reaction, you would not see a nice exponential drop in the concentration with time, you would see, um, and you'd see something that was different than an exponential curve. And that would be an uh, indication to you that there was something else going on. It's never, it's usually not quite that simple, of course. You have to, you have to optimize the right potential to be at to avoid these side reactions. And so sometimes if you want to go to a different potential to minimize that, that makes the reaction slower than you would otherwise like and so on, and because of the, at the end you'll look at the Nernst equation and say what's the actual value of the concentration I get, and because the potential react may not be able to get a complete re removal of the material because at equilibrium it would be so much. Um, at that point though then you could say well let's change the potential a little bit more and finish it up, finish up the job. But you, so you would avoid most of the side reactions over the majority of the electrolysis period, but then at the end you could have some side reactions using less electricity to do those reactions and then finish the job. So that's what people usually do to, to finish things up. Okay, that's uh, in the related, the kind of related to what uh, Raphael just asked. Suppose we want to, that's this next sort of topic. Suppose we want to make sure that when we're doing this copper, we're not electrolyzing some other component and that we know is there that will be uh, interferent. So what's the, optimal conditions for that kind of situation. And so the notes say, suppose we want to separate one component from the mixture or electrolyze one species and not the second. Or we want to remove an impurity from the mixture but not uh, upset 
the otherwise the other concentrations in this in the solution. So we need to consider it how the one process can be efficiently removed in the component without removing the other. So in order to do that, we need to th set up a, a thing called a current efficiency as a, as a guide. So we'll call phi as our current efficiency, and we can call it n, the number of electrons times the moles of product formed. over the Faraday's of charge passed. Now if our reaction is perfectly efficient, all the electrons that we expect go into the reaction, in this case for the copper we need two electrons to make one mole of, two electrons per mole of copper two to make copper zero. And if we divide that by the Faraday, uh, we should have a, a current efficiency of one. If we find at the end of the process that the number is 0.8 or 0.5, that means that we've got a significant other reaction going on that's using those electrons for some other purpose. Sometimes it's possible to get a current efficiency greater than one. That means that we've made something that actually uh, catalyzes the reaction or some, some system in the solution can, can, uh, can do the reaction that way and that's kind of unusual case, but it can happen. So the additional reaction, the side reaction is going to change our value of phi, change our current efficiency. Let's consider this problem. Suppose we have two components, O1, which requires N sub 1 electrons to make species R1, and we have species O2, which requires N sub 2 number of electrons to make species R1. Um, two, not R one. And we want to remove O one from the system. And that might be by we might want to remove O one because when we reduce it, uh, or because its presence is objectionable. But by reducing it, it forms a solid material that can be um, deposited on the electrode or perhaps filtered out of the solution. Now, in order to do this, obviously O1 has to have a less negative potential than O2. In other words, redox potential is what I mean. If obviously, if O1 potential is more negative than O2, at every potential that we ever apply, O2 will be reduced first in preference to O1. Uh, so we do need a lower potential or less negative potential for O1, obviously. Now, that may be a thermodynamic redox potential that's there, but sometimes we can rely on kinetics to make that potential separation because O1 may have the same potential or even more negative than O2, but because the kinetic limitations is not efficiently electrolyzed that particular potential. An example would be hydrogen ions. On a mercury electrode, hydrogens would be expect the thermodynamic to be reduced at zero volts, but because of the slow reaction kinetics, is a, there's a large over potential, minus two volts for that. And so you can often do reactions where hydrogen would otherwise be reduced uh, to, do, um, to do reactions that would otherwise have a, a more positive poten electrode potential. Now, obviously, that's one situation. Now let's consider first though if, if both are reversible and that would be not considering the fact that if, if kinetic limitations entered into it. So in both, if both are reversible then we can use the Nernst equation to help us out. First of all let's ask ourselves what potential do we need to get 99.1% 99.9% of O1 reduction to R1. All right, well, that's the Nernst equation. You should be able to figure that out. So let's put that in. The potential would be the E0 uh, plus RT over NF log of CO over C sub R.
and the moles of O1 at equilibrium would be um, V1, C1, CO1 star, and the R1 at equilibrium All right, and uh, where CO1 star is the initial concentration of O1. So solving that, E is equal to E01 plus RT over um, N1F. I don't know why I have N2 there. Who knows? Natural log of 1 minus x1 over x1. And solving that, you can solve that. We want 99.9%. .9 and that gives us a value of approximately E minus 0 0.059 um, times 3 over N at 25 degrees, which is uh, 177. And if we convert it back to mil N, number of Ns, 177 N millivolts more negative than E1. In other words, we need to be on our plateau for O1 assuming this is E0, we need to be 177 millivolts past that to be at 99.9% .9 reduction of O1 to R1. Now, problem is suppose R2 is in that region of, uh, of 177, suppose we look at this wave and we see, okay, the wave for R2 is here. All right, that would be a problem, wouldn't it? We couldn't be at 177 millivolts and get rid of O1. We would get all of O1 would be definitely eliminated, but a large amount of O2 would also be electrolyzed under those conditions. In fact, you could determine what the final amount of O2 to R2 would be under those. Now again, that may not be a problem because what you can think of this, suppose O1 is a metallic or a metal ion, you can remove it to R1 and O2 to R2 may be two soluble forms of the species. So you can reduce R1 to the metal, remove your electrode from solution, and then put in an, an unplated electrode or take the material off in a separate solution, put that electrode back, now you've got a mixture of O2 and R2 generated at this particular point. You could just oxidize it back to get to back to your original amount of O2. So that would be a better, a nice uh, ideal case and that's often what people will do. They'll, they may partially uh, do a reaction for the other species, but then can able later get back to the original conditions by another electrolysis step. But let's suppose we are in that sort of situation. We don't want to be in that uh, situation if we can help it, so what we would all otherwise want to ask ourselves, where would we prefer to be if our two waves are close together? What potential is optimum? for the two waves. Okay, wave one and wave two. Now you might uh, look at that and say, well, you want to be the middle. And it turns out that's the, that's the answer, but let's see if we can determine why the middle potential is the optimum point. In this case, E is equal, E2 is equal to E20 prime plus RT 
over N2 F So just like in the case for species one, we can use the Nernst equation for species two to determine what the potential would be uh, for E2 to produce some equilibrium amount of O2 and R2. So again, we're trying to figure out what the equilibrium potentials or conditions are for O1 and R1, and at the same time figure out what the equilibrium conditions are for O2 and R2. Again, reversible case. This is often not the situation that we're going to be dealing with, but uh, gives us some idea what to think about. Now, the best separation is going to occur between the two components. Let's assume that N1 is equal to N2 for convenience. We can derive it for not that case, but this makes it a little bit easier. Uh, e is set to the average of E1 and E2. E is equal to E1, 0, plus E2, 0. Then in that case, because of the Nernst equation and N1 is equal to E2, we find that X2 is equal to 1 minus X1. So E0, 1, minus E0, 2, ends up being equal to RT over 2NF, natural log of X1 over X2, which is equal to 118 over N times the log of X1 over X2, again at 25 degrees C. So if we want to make sure that we have 99.9% .9 separation of the two components, in other words, X1 and X2 have a difference of one part in a thousand, we just set that up and we find that that equals to Is that right? Doesn't seem right. Three, is it? Yes, three times. Okay, yeah, 355 millivolts over N. In other words, we would need a, a separation of at least that potential difference to get 99.9% uh, separation between the two components. If it's less than that, we would not be able to get 99.9% .9 separation of the two components. If it's more than that, obviously we could. Less than that, we would not. Now, this is a reversible case. If both of the, if both of the reactions are irreversible, then we can squeeze that in together because in that case we would, could rely on the over potential effects to minimize the potential differences that we would need to, need to have. Okay. So both of those things, one, one is we can figure out where we need to be at if we want to make sure we remove completely some component, and that doesn't matter what component, if we're do, you know, doing any sort of bulk electrolysis, this initial uh, calculation would be true. Second calculation is if we have two components in the mixture, how can we ensure that we're going to get a good separation? And that 355 over N millivolts would tell us, okay, if we have that much or more potential, we can get at least the one part and 10 to the third uh, separation in the two components. Otherwise, we're going to have to be satisfied with some other lesser separation. All right. All right. Let's um, ask ourselves about another particular method. 
Well, let's go back to, uh, once we, now we kind of know what we, potentials we need to have to do these reactions. Let's ask ourselves, uh, let's do some uh, understanding of the different methods that we talked about. Uh, let's talk about electrogravimetric methods. We are interested in electrogravimetry and removing one material from a solution by plating it onto an electrode and then using, uh, gravimetry always refers to a, a weighing process. We're gonna weigh that material later on. Um, it's used again for determinations of amount of material in a system. The idea is you exhaustively plate of the metal onto the electrode. Sometimes non-metal species can be done, but this is usually metals. And it's one of the earliest methods because you really didn't need any controlled potential or current. Now you need, you would need some conditions to make sure it worked right, but you don't really need a controlled current or potential source. So it's an easy way to do it, earliest method people used for electroanalysis. Uh, you just plate it out and it doesn't matter about the conditions, you don't have to measure the current or the potential, you just plate it out. After you're done, you take the material out, you wash it, you dry it carefully to remove any trapped uh, solvent and you weigh it. And so the difference between the initial electrode weight and the final electrode weight is gonna be proportional to the concentration you had of the material in the first place. Obviously, this is a pain in the neck. It's a very, you know, it's easy to make errors, by, like I said, by the material not adhering to the plate or because you've got solution in the system or because you co-plate other materials at the same time. You might plate out not only one metal but another metal at the same time. You might include particulate impurities in the plating and so, and so on and so on and so on. So it's not used very much at any, any more. It is still used, as I said, as a method for determining some sort of electrochemical process, like I said, the silver plating process to determine the Coulomb is an example of electrogravimetry that's still being done. Now that's because the silver plating is very reproducible, very easy to, um, to do with care to make these nice adherent smooth things without inclusions and so on, so it's actually useful in that regard. But that's only in one particular example that people still are doing that sort of thing. Uh, 